Whoop whoop everyone! What is it about the Insane Clown Posse that garners such a divided reaction? Well, I was a big fan of ICP back in the day anyway. Fuck you and everybody that looks like you! But they're great guys, man. They yeah. like You little fucking fart face motherfucking cocksucking son of a bitch and bastardized prick artist cheeky Which fucking one? clowns. Very nice, respectful guys to me, the little miss of this family. <laughs> For decades now, ICP has been considered one of the most hated musical groups by critics and mainstream fans alike. They've been called the absolute worst band in history. My whole life, I've never bore witness to as much negativity for any one band as I have for the Insane Clown Posse. I've heard more fawning praise for Gigi Allen. Even their Juggalo fan base, one of the most loyal I've ever seen, has been labeled a gang by the FBI, which I find absolutely ridiculous. The ICP fans I've seen have never been any more menacing than some light harassment I got when I was working at the mall food court back in high school. Excuse me, sir, stop on by Euros Euros and uh, try a sample of our seasoned Euro meats. Oh, hey, what the? Look at the dumb Juffalo. Whoop, whoop. Hey, come on, Jared, that's not cool, man. I'm like one of you, kind of. Yes, full disclosure, at one point in my life, I listened to a lot of ICP. I even still have those albums. I don't think I was a juggalo back then, but I did have a sweet Blacklight Jekyll Brothers poster in my room once. Anyway, love them or hate them, ICP have been experts at drawing attention. Even if you've never listened to their music, chances are you know exactly what they look like. And if you're a wrestling fan, you've no doubt seen some footage somewhere of them in action. Whether it's been for the Backyard Wrestling video games, or for their own promotion, Juggalo Championship Wrestling, which they've run since 1999, or for some of the biggest Federations of the country, Shaggy 2 Dope and Violent J have certainly made their mark on pro wrestling. On this fresh episode of Wrestling With Regret, we're going to look back at ICP through the years in America's major wrestling federations. So throw away that PhD, your play ahead is degree that is, as we look back at this curious point in history. What? What's wrong? There's something on my face? Our story begins way back in the 1980s. Not only was the inner city posse getting established in the Detroit rap scene, they were also working various independent wrestling promotions after teaching themselves how to wrestle and having run their own backyard league. In August of 1997, they made their first appearance on a wrestling pay-per-view, performing music at ECW's Hardcore Heaven in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. After the in-ring concert, they were jumped by top heels Rob Van Dam and Sabu. According to Violent J, that kick by RVD ruptured his eardrum, making him temporarily deaf. Hmm, we're really tempted to make a joke here, but come on, Brian, you can fight the urge. Don't say it. Don't say that RVD did Violent J a favor by making him unable to hear his own music. Damn it! Then we fast forward to May of 1998. On an episode of Raw, we saw the return of the Jackal, aka Don Callis, in a previous life. After conferring with members of Howard Stern's whack pack like Hank the Angry Drunken Dwarf and Bob the Crackhead, hey, did Stern have some creative names for people or what? Jackal then brought out what he called the Parade of Human Oddities, Luna Vachon, the Giant Silva, and Golga, who was actually former tag team champion Earthquake under a mask. What has the Jackal orchestrated here? Look at that, look at the size of that man's hand. JR, I'm looking at the wrestling equivalent of scabies, and you're talking about somebody's hand? But the Jackal didn't stay with the oddities for long. He soon left them and helped form the Acolytes, and before you know it, was gone from the company entirely. By the summer, the group popped back up, thanks to Sable of all people. They added former Truth Commission member Kurgan, and suddenly they were shown as a group of happy-go-lucky babyfaces, embracing their freakishness instead of being angry about it. Now I have to say, these guys might have been voted by the readers of The Observer as 1998's worst tag team and gimmick, but make no mistake, these guys were over as hell. Sure, it was a goofy act, and nobody was going to become world champion after this run, but every week the fans still went nuts for these guys. They loved to see Kurgan try to dance, they loved seeing Golga swing his Cartman doll around, and they loved their theme music, which was performed by, you guessed it, the Insane Clown Posse. ICP made their on-air debut for the WWF at SummerSlam that year, performing the Oddities theme song for the crowd at Madison Square Garden. And in a rare case, the team with the big live musical number actually won the match. Hell, it even happened twice in the same show! The posse would accompany the Oddities to the ring on and off for months, basically whenever their touring schedule allowed for it. It's worth pointing out they were never actually paid to show up, as they were under an agreement with the company that the WWF would air ICP commercials in exchange for their appearances. But those commercials never aired. Fucking contracts, how do they work? ICP began interfering in matches, especially at the cost of the headbangers. And man, it must have eaten Jim Cornette alive to have to try and put these guys over on commentary. Well, the whole place is having a party, Shane. I know you love these guys. Seems like everybody loves the insane. 
insane clown posse! Eventually, Jay and Shaggy did start wrestling against Mosh and Thrasher, who allegedly stiffed and sandbagged them repeatedly. Now, despite the fact the company knew these guys had prior in-ring experience, the WWF never bothered to mention that fact. They just started having matches on TV. While I get the idea that divulging the information makes it less of a surprise that they can actually get in the ring and perform, a lack of explanation sure seemed to promote the idea that anybody could wrestle. It's almost like they were saying, hey kids, don't try this at home or else you'll end up like ICP, or the Hardy Boys, or CM Punk at first. They're very inconsistent with the message. On the Raw before Thanksgiving, the Insane Clown Posse turned on the oddities and joined forces with the Headbangers, the same guys who'd been beating the piss out of them for weeks. I suppose it's kind of a if you can't beat them, join them scenario, but well, we never got a proper explanation from our boys. The next week, the Wicked Clowns came down to the ring with the Headbangers. Steve Austin showed up because he's Steve Austin, can do what he wants, and proceeded to murder the whole lot of them. Perhaps if our heroes had some magic ninjas at their disposal, things could have gone differently. Magic, magic, ninjas, what? Magic, magic, ninjas, what? After making several appearances for no pay and the WWF seemingly not meeting their end of the arrangement, the posse departed from the company. But the late Luna Vachon had a different theory as to why they left. She was going to had it set up. She was going to shoot a shaggy. They were going to work a match and they quit. They didn't want to And then they went to WCW, fucking pussy, <laughs> prick artist, fucking clown. We jump ahead to July of 1999. By this point, all of the oddities were long gone from the WWF. But over in WCW, the men responsible for their catchy theme suddenly appeared on an episode of Nitro, alongside Vampiro and Raven. It was on this night that the four of them formed a group and called themselves the Deadpool. Then Raven split for ECW the following month. See, it was all part of Raven's master plan to jump from one sinking ship onto another sinking ship, all to end up in the WWF, where he himself got sunk. Ooh, man, that's even more devious than whatever his Seven Deadly Sins angle was going to be. The remaining three renamed themselves the Dark Carnival, and it's kind of a wonder that backyard feds all over the country didn't file a class action lawsuit over the name on the spot. Eventually, the Carnival gained some new members, including the Kiss Demon and the Great Frickin' Muda. Now, aside from the incredible coup they scored by getting Muda, I'm torn on the validity of the demon being there. Because on the one hand, it does make a lot of sense. Both ICP and KISS have some of the most marketable, recognizable looks in pop culture, along with some of the most, let's just say, devoted fans. Not only that, both bands are kind of seen as the red-headed stepkids of their respective genres. They're crapped on a lot by critics, mostly because it's the hip thing to do. So putting them together is actually kind of poetic. On the other hand, when you compare the demon's body of work to guys like Muda and Vampiro, you realize one of these things is not like the other. Was he just put in the group because his face is also painted? That's kind of a low bar. Why not include the Zodiac and the Shark and the Stalker and one half of Roddy Piper while we're at it? The clowns appeared on and off in WCW from that July all the way to September of 2000, a much longer span than in the WWF. Compared to their time in the World Wrestling Federation, who refused to promote their work outside of the company, WCW gave ICP a lot of leeway in promoting their newly formed Juggalo Championship Wrestling, even going so far as to have Vampiro come out with the belt, and occasionally have Shaggy and Jay commandeer the announce table under their JCW announcement names to pretty hilarious results. Vampiro will be taking on the likes of Pink Flabbage. Now right there you're looking at a good look at Pink Rabbit. Because what Hank Sandwich does not realize right here is this is JCW now. Pink Sandwich does have boxer shorts as Vampiro is beating his face repeatedly. The carnival reached their high point during the New Blood Rising pay-per-view in August of 2000 when Vampiro and Muda beat Chronic to become the new tag team champions. Not only was this Chronic's second defense of the night, it was Muda's second match of the show as well, having previously lost to Ernest Miller of all people. The show also featured Goldberg, quote, not going along with the script and the infamous Judy Bagwell on a forklift match. I wanted to write a joke about that, but the work's already been done. ICP's final appearance in WCW was that September when they were feuding with that 70s guy Mike Awesome, yet another classic Russo creation. The rivalry ended in a hardcore handicap match on Nitro that saw Shaggy 2 get hit with the Awesome Bomb on top of the Partridge Family bus, then slowly sliding off said bus onto the concrete. Ugh. In February of 2002, the Monday Night War was long over, but out of the ashes of ECW formed Ring of Honor. From the very beginning, they established themselves as a no-frills, no-gimmick enterprise, just wrestling. So naturally, the Insane Clown Posse was a perfect fit. In October of 2002, Philadelphia hosted the first ever Glory by Honor event. The posse made a surprise appearance on the show, taking on East Coast wrestlers Diablo Santiago and Oman Tortuga. And boy, the fans sure were happy to see the clowns in action. Shaggy and Jay beat their opponents using only the finest psychology in the sub-60 second match and were met with chants of don't come back, and what a shock they didn't. Apparently the match was such an embarrassment for the company it was kept off the show's home video release. 
Soaring of Honor got a little bit of flack for booking ICP for a show because it flies in the face of everything they've ever stood for. Hey, I get why people were upset, but the next place the posse went to had no such standards. After all, their initials were TNA. The final stop in this Joker's card journey took place in early 2004. NWA TNA wasn't even two years old at this point and was still running weekly pay-per-views in Nashville instead of the traditional TV format. It was on January 21st when Shaggy Two Dope and Violent J appeared as fans in the crowd before getting involved in Jeff Jarrett's business with a deadly Fago blast. The soda may be cheap, but getting it out of your clothes is not. The duo made their in-ring debut on February 4th, beating Glenn Gilberti and David Young. Considering the last time we saw those two guys was during a show that tried to convert wrestling fans to follow Jesus, it's hard for me to say which moment was worse for them. But the feud wasn't over yet, as the two sides fought again, and again, and again over the next several weeks, finally blowing off in a dark carnival match in March, when Disco, Young, and Kid Cash beat ICP and JCW wrestler Too Tough Tony. The group was gone by March 10th, just a blip on the radar, but hey, long enough to get a desktop background made for them on the website. Though ICP would never appear in a large on-air capacity for TNA again, they did go on to have a relationship with the company. In 2006, they promoted and booked TNA's first ever house show in Detroit, which included ICP defeating Eric Young and Petey Williams. They also made a surprise appearance in the audience alongside Scott Hall at Turning Point 2008. Hall's appearance is especially ironic considering he was booked to wrestle at the previous year's event and no-showed. <laughs> Better late than never, I guess. There are also claims online that ICP's incredibly brief time in TNA brought the largest paying crowds in company history. Not only is there no way to verify that, that isn't saying much, considering very few people pay to see the Asylum shows in the first place. And so ends the story of the Insane Clown Posse and their involvement in mainstream American wrestling. As a former fan, I have to say, I am very conflicted as to how this all went down. ICP had a big uphill battle for respect in the WWF. Few of the wrestlers really knew what they had done in wrestling before, so there was the impression they hadn't paid their dues. Throw in the fact they often had to get their own dressing room with a mirror to apply their face paint, and you find yourself in a big political hornet's nest. WCW was the first to get it right, using the band's affiliation with Juggalo Championship Wrestling to help provide some justification of their wrestling ability. But even with all that, they were never going to escape the stigma of being part of a band that was so despised, and therefore they were never going to be taken seriously as wrestlers. Though it was good for their overall exposure, appearing for the WWF and WCW kind of ran against their whole underground DIY ethic. They were part of those companies when wrestling was at its most culturally relevant. There was nothing underground about what they were doing there. Now them showing up for the fledgling TNA and ROH when wrestling's on a downturn, that's a counterculture move. In all honesty, ICP doesn't belong in mainstream wrestling, but that's how they like it. JCW is still going strong almost 20 years later with a massive cult following and the ability to bring in some of the biggest names of the past and present for their shows. Don't get confused, ICP is still very much involved in pro wrestling, only it's on their terms, which is pretty admirable. In the end, I feel that ICP's involvement in the major federations was harmless fun. They may not have helped the perception of wrestling, but they didn't hurt it any more than satanic rituals, pimping, hand birthing, or Viagra on a pole did. They were never part of any main event scene and were kept in very narrow storylines. Those they did beat were never meant to be major deals in the first place, so losing to ICP wasn't a huge blemish on their record. Seeing the insane clown posse on Raw and Nitro was an interesting experiment that always got a reaction, but it only worked for the time that they did it. In the end, the fact they got some major exposure at the end of all this is definitely worthy of some clown love. Be sure to thumbs up this video if you like it, comment below, subscribe to Wrestling With Regret, and buy the t-shirts at ProWrestlingTees.com. I'm Brian Zane, and I'll see you next time. What is a juggalo? A Hulkamaniac. He power bombs motherfuckers in the thumbtacks. People like him till they find out he's unstable. He said, booed your mama through a coffee table. What is a juggalo?